Section One of Wellington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Wellington by George Hooper. Chapter One. Arthur Wesley. Sometime in the spring of 1769, either in April or May, at Dublin or at Dangan Castle, County Meath, the boy was born whose name became and is familiar and famous to all the world, Wellington. His father was Garrett, Earl of Mornington, a lover and composer of music. His mother was Anne Hill, a daughter of Lord Dungannon. He was christened Arthur, and he had three brothers who were men of mark in their day. The family name of his house, then Wesley, was afterwards transformed into Wellesley, which is described as the ancient spelling, but if one of that family came from Somerset, the spelling in the reign of Edward I was Wellesley, Richard de Wellesley being set down in Rymer as the leader of a body of levies who took part in the Scottish wars. According to Mr. Gleig, Arthur was descended from a man of English stock, Walter Cowley, or Cowley, who migrated in the 15th century from Rutlandshire to Ireland. His surname he derived from the Wesleys, also ancient settlers therein, his grandfather Richard Cowley having acquired that name by adoption into the Wesley family. As Lady Mornington always insisted that her son Arthur was born on May Day of 1769, and as Arthur himself kept that as his birthday, we may reasonably accept it, although his baptismal certificate is dated the 30th, and an election committee of the Irish House of Commons decided that he must have been born before April 29th, but the committee's decision cannot be regarded as trustworthy evidence. Let the Duke's birthday stand as May 1st, just as that of the young Corsican Bonaparte, who was named Napoleon, is now allotted to August 15th in the same year, despite surviving doubts whether it was on that or on another day that his mother, the beautiful Letitia, hurried from church to give the world a conqueror. The curious traveller and the political enthusiast visit the Casa Bonaparte and Ayaccio, the wellspring of a grand realistic romance. Wellington has no shrine, and we must be content to know that he was an Irishman, sprung from an English stock, whose birthplace and birthday neither the duke nor any member of his family treated as worthy of a moment's consideration. Indifference to non-essentials is one note of Wellington's career, throughout which the theatrical and legendary element was conspicuous by its absence. But it was not wanting in romance, for, as we shall see, the dunce of the family came to be the victor of Asai, Vittoria, and Waterloo. The incidents of his childhood and youth are only faintly indicated in the traditions which remain. We are told that his mother had no fondness for her son Arthur. Mr. Gleek says that her feeling toward him was not far removed from aversion, and thus he had not much home life after he had passed out of the nursery. Certain it is that he rarely alluded to his early days, and the conduct attributed to Lady Mornington may account for his perfunctory visits to her when he was the duke, which made Mr. Greville, who could know nothing of the facts, write him down a hard man. At some time, then, he was placed in a school at Chelsea, whence for a brief period he went to Eton. In neither did he shine, and it has been often said that in after years, when Eton was proud of him, nothing could be remembered to his credit or discredit except that he fought a battle with Bubba Smith the brother of the witty canon of St. Paul's. From Eton he was sent to a French military school, England, according to her wont, having none of her own, and no military institutions of any sort, nothing but makeshifts for institutions. The French school selected for Arthur Wesley was at Angers on the Maine. Mr. Rakes was told by General Sir A. Mackenzie that the school was much frequented by young Englishmen because the governor, the Marquis de Pignerol, an engineer, looked after their studies, and also because his brother had a fine riding school. The general remembered the young Arthur, but all he could say was that the boy was rather weak in health, not very attentive to his studies, and constantly occupied with a little terrier called Bick, which followed him everywhere. 
A more definite glimpse of the student than that we cannot give. It is as vague as the boxing match at Eton, but it enables us to picture the slim, bright-eyed boy idling in the streets of the picturesque old town or playing with Vic on the steep cliffs which rise out of the water just below the confluence of three streams. Did he read King John or the memoirs of Richelieu, or try to comprehend on the spot the foolish fight at the Pont de Cé down on the Loire? He dined with the neighboring great folks, met Sies and de Jocourt, and acquired some knowledge of the French tongue which served him well in after life. It is not on record when he went to Angers, nor how long he stayed there. He said himself a year, perhaps, nor when he quitted the school so dim it all is. But General Mackenzie told Mr. Rakes that they left Angers together and drove into Paris in a broken cabriolet de poste, and that they put up at a mean sort of inn near the Palais Royal, probably toward the end of 1786, for in 1787, Arthur Wesley became an ensign in the seventy-third foot, the first fixed date in his story subsequent to the year of his birth. His elder brother Richard, Earl of Mornington, since his father's death in 1781, and a shining academic scholar, watched over the lad and pushed him along. Political and social influences went for much then, whatever they do now, and the ensign soon appeared as a lieutenant of the 76th and 41st, a subaltern in the twelfth light dragoons and next as a captain in the fifty-eighth foot and then as captain in the eighteenth light dragoons all between seventeen eighty seven and seventeen ninety two nor did the shifting process end there for he first got a majority and then by purchase the lieutenant colonelcy of the thirty-third in the autumn of seventeen ninety three it was his brother who helped him to the money which made the last step feasible, the brother who probably knew his capacity when it was invisible to others, and whose insight was amply justified. Thus Arthur had the command of a battalion at twenty-four, but he was beaten in that line by Stapleton Cotton, whose family influence placed him in 1794, when he was twenty-one, at the head of the twenty-fifth Light Dragoons. Wealth and interest were nearly all powerful, it was the palmy day of purchase, which George the Third had tried and failed to abolish, and until the Duke of York became commander-in-chief, infants of both sexes figured in the army list as the holders of commissions. Before he had blossomed into a battalion commander, the Viceroy of Ireland, Lord Westmoreland, put him on his staff, and his successor, Lord Camden, retained him as an aide-de-camp. He also entered the Irish House of Commons, sitting for the borough of Trim, and it was on this occasion that a committee had to decide whether or not, in April 1790, he had attained his majority. They seated him, but their report cannot be accepted as evidence of his age, for party knew no scruples. Neither the vice-regal court nor the Parliament House were highly moral schools. One was profligate, and the other corrupt, but his subsequent career showed that the young soldier took no harm from either. How he behaved under temptations common to all and resistless for many is not authentically recorded, and we have to infer it from the fruits borne by the tree in riper years. Stories are told of extravagance and debts and of loans advanced by tradesmen which enabled the young soldier to go abroad on foreign service. They may be true, though why it should be thought astonishing that a younger son in a semi-royal court could not live on his pay, and why drapers and shoemakers should not lend money as well as bankers and bill discounters has never been made clear. In after years the Duke of Wellington said that he never got into debt, which cannot mean that he always paid ready money. And the Dublin anecdotes, which are very vague, refer probably to nothing more than the stress on the pocket caused by a summons to embark for the West Indies or the Low Countries. The one fact about him which is indubitable is that he was cheerful and had many friends, and that he wooed and won Lady Charlotte Pakenham, daughter of Lord Longford, that when her parents refused their consent to the match, the two young folks sighed and obeyed. Like Gibbon, yet unlike him, their affections endured the trial of discouragement and absence, 
so that when ten years afterwards the little aide-de-camp returned from india as a major-general and a victor in great battles the lord and lady longford discovered that he was a prize and the faithful lovers were rewarded for their constancy the truth is that the dublin folks did not or could not look below the surface and that the essential qualities of the young soldier were precisely those which courtiers and politicians are the least likely to discern he was dull so they thought because he had not the superficial glitter and precocity the conventional hallmarks which common minds often regard as signs of talent or genius he was the ugly duckling whose brilliant transformation is such a source of astonishment and perplexity to the ordinary run of mankind the butterfly period of his life when he had to hover in attendance on the viceroy ended with his promotion to the command of the thirty-third foot in september seventeen ninety three here we come upon a fact which illustrates the character of the young colonel and is certainly a note of promise for he took up his work as a leader of men in earnest and proved at once that while apparently idle and frivolous he had not wasted his time so steadily did he apply himself to the task of working his regiment up to the highest attainable point that in a few months it was officially declared to be the best drilled and most efficient within the limits of the irish command the reason of course was that lieutenant colonel wesley not only directed the work but saw that it was done this labor was the first piece of hard practical work he had to perform and the result gives a clue to his life's work which in all he undertook was thorough the quality of the man came out when the touchstone was applied and only required a larger field and a tougher task to produce still more surprises while he was drilling the thirty-third the youthful genius who signed himself at that date bonaparte was engaged in wrestling toulon from the royalists and the english upon a plan which he had the courage to tell the minister of war was the only practicable plan a truth which luckily for them the committee of public safety recognized it is instructive now to read even the names of some of the batteries the breechless the fearless men the mountain the convention to learn from him who was to become napoleon that general du gommier fought with truly republican courage and that his business-like and indefatigable eulogist was constructing improved furnaces for the heating of red-hot shot wherewith to burn up the ships of the despots but it was the correct tone and language whatever his words might be at one epoch or another the future emperor was just as much in earnest and as thorough going as the colonel of the thirty-third foot the french revolution which prepared a field for both during that winter of seventeen ninety three ninety four had brought forth the reign of terror and was displaying its wickedness within and its vast strength without young france had risen against tyrants and old europe had risen against france ever since the beginning of seventeen ninety three warfare in which england took part had raged in the low countries at first with a show of vigour and success which later was impaired then ruined by inaptitude and selfishness the memorable siege of toulon with its result was only one of many reverses endured by the allies nor can it be said that they were undeserved by the end of the year the invading armies of the first coalition were all thwarted and compelled to retire and during the next young france broke over the frontier in fiery torrents which could not be withstood the bearing of the english troops under the duke of york was worthy of their ancient renown but they shared in the general disaster and were obliged to retreat before the republican hosts the summer months of seventeen ninety four saw indeed the downfall of robespierre and the glorious first of june but they also saw the english army thrust back as far as antwerp and the whole line of the allies thrust back everywhere from the pyrenees to the mouth of the scheldt some time in may before the allies had been beaten at turquin the english government projected one of those expeditions to the coast of france which young bonaparte a year later spoke of with such scorn lord moira was to make a descent upon brittany 
and the thirty-third was included in the corps destined for that operation. Arthur Wesley at once resigned his seat and hastened to Cork, where he joined his regiment but the deplorable intelligence from Belgium showed the government that succour must be sent promptly to the Duke of York, and Lord Moira embarked his battalions for Ostend. Yet so swiftly ran the stream of French success that he had only just time to land the greater part of his troops and to hurry out of Ostend on the road to Malines as the French were pouring in from the other side. The 33rd did not march with the main body, but went by sea to Antwerp, were beaten at Oudenarde, the duke and his army soon arrived. At this moment the allies were cut in two by the French armies, the Austrians having retreated over the Meuse by Maastricht, and the English having taken the road to Holland. Thenceforward they had no alternative but retreat, and Wesley's first active service was rendered in a British army marching away from its foes. First the duke moved from Antwerp upon Breda, but unable to remain there, lest he should be turned, he fell back still farther, trusting that he might be able to pass the Meuse near Grave, and thus retain his connection with Germany. Had the Dutch people been friendly, he might have tried to defend Holland, but their sympathies were with the French and the Revolution, and consequently safety alone lay in a northward march. To cover the columns heading for the Meuse, he placed a rear guard of Hessians and Buxtel, a village on the Dommel, but on September 14th, Piche Gorus Frenchmen forded the stream, broke into the village, and cut up the detachment. The Duke, who was then at Uden on the Ah, sent General Abercrombie with the guards, four line regiments, a complement of horse, and some guns to retake Buxtel. They marched in the night and sighted the position at dawn, only to find the enemy on the alert and in great force. Abercrombie judged that it would be well not to attack, yet did not so decide until part of his troops were engaged. In fact, the guards' company in advance lost men and prisoners, and in the retreat there was some confusion in a lane where a light dragoon regiment mixed themselves up with the infantry. Throughout the morning the 33rd were in support, and at this critical moment were well handled, for Colonel Wesley noting the entanglement and seeing the enemy's horse preparing to charge, drew up his battalion across the outlet from the lane, leaving an opening for the retreating crowd. Then, when they had got clear, he wheeled the center companies into line to fill the gap, and the 33rd, opening a steady fire upon the pursuers, slew and wounded many and brought the pursuit to an end. It was a trifling incident in war, but important to us because the skirmish near Buxtel was Wesley's first engagement and because his coolness and promptitude attracted the notice of Dundas, a shining light in the world of tactics and parade maneuvers. The French halted on the A, and the Duke of York, crossing the Meuse at Grave, next placed the Val, one branch of the Rhine, between him and his foes. He could not stay even there, but was obliged to recede over the next channel of the Rhine at Anheim. There he quitted the army to assume the post of commander-in-chief in England, and Count Valmoden led the much-tried troops ever northward until they reached Bremen and the British transports. This retreat was made in winter weather of unusual severity, so that the troops endured great privations, fatigues, and miseries. But they persisted despite the ice and snow and attained the ships in the spring. What we have to note is that Colonel Wesley was selected to command the rear guard and faithfully accomplished the arduous task. To him the escape seemed miraculous. In after years, says Mr. Gleek, he used to describe how the army was conducted. If we happened to be at dinner and the wine was going round, it was considered wrong to interrupt us. I have seen a packet handed in from the Austrian headquarters and thrown aside unopened with a remark, that will keep till tomorrow morning. It has always been a marvel to me how any one of us escaped. But the lesson struck deep into that young observant mind and bore fruit in after years. Bonaparte, in like manner, writing to the Committee of Public Safety toward the end of 1793, described the staff before Toulon as a tas d'ignorants who did not understand their trade. 
the business of warfare had to be learnt by both sides in the exacting school of experience because as the precocious young corsican said three-fourths of mankind never concern themselves with what is necessary until they feel the want of it and then it is too late yet the french had one great advantage which has not escaped the keen eye of sir edward hamley they had the heritage of regular systematic training given in the camps of instruction under the old regime when the new methods were devised and taught which enabled the republican levies to prevail over the old tactics the costly lesson is as old as the world but there are nations which still have to learn that bacon's maxim not to advance is to go back applies to nothing so strictly as it does to military institutions and the conduct of war the commander of the thirty third brought back his regiment to england in the spring of seventeen ninety five we can imagine in what meditative frame of mind war he knew was a most serious business one on the management of which not only the lives and limbs of men but the fortunes of kingdoms were put to hazard yet how strangely had he seen it conducted so conducted indeed that escape from the supreme risks involved seemed miraculous it ran counter to all his ideas of exactitude vigilance foresight and thoroughness the facts of that campaign in belgium and holland left an ineradicable impression out of which grew grave and earnest meditations which bore unexpected fruit wesley on leave of absence being obtained went to his home at trim he must have thought over the condition of his profession in britain and wondered to himself whether it were a wise man's part to follow the career of arms that is evident from the letter which after consulting his brother lord mornington he wrote to lord camden the viceroy in june of seventeen ninety five fresh from a campaign in which he at least had won some credit by faithful service he asked humbly for a place in some civil department the revenue or treasury board by preference but declared his willingness to accept the viceroy's decision you will be surprised he wrote at my desiring a civil instead of a military office it certainly is a departure from the line which i prefer but i see the manner in which military offices are filled and i don't wish to ask you for that which i know you cannot give me the source of this remarkable attempt to quit the army may be clearly traced to his disgust at the mode in which it was managed and the small prospect of any effective change for the better his application must be regarded by the light he himself sheds upon that period of his life when he described the slovenly mode of conducting war which marked the campaign of ninety four ninety five if circumstances he is reported to have said had not made him a soldier having the gift of rapid and correct calculation he would probably have become distinguished in public life as a financier nothing is more probable but lord camden did not comply with his request and his preeminent business faculty remained for use where it was so greatly needed still for a time at least he ran the risk of dying of yellow fever after a brief sojourn in ireland he was ordered to join his regiment which had been selected to form part of an expedition to the west indies he and they embarked but the autumn winds were adverse and after striving for six weeks to get out of the channel the squadron of transports and men of war sought rest and safety in the waters whence they started at spithead he led his regiment to Poole in january seventeen ninety six and while there he became so ill that when the thirty third was ordered this time to the east indies the colonel unfit to embark was compelled to remain but he secured a passage in a swift man-of-war and overtook the transports at the cape his destination was calcutta and the change wrought by science and navigation is brought home to the modern traveller when he is told that the thirty-third and its commander did not land in the capital of bengal until february of seventeen ninety seven arthur wesley was now in his twenty-eighth year he had been obscure as a neglected schoolboy unmarked as a military student on the men supposed to be an idler as an aide-de-camp and nearly silent as a member of parliament for never in his life was he in the least self-advertising probably few except his brothers especially richard 
guessed what sterling qualities lurked under the surface or knew how much he worked in his own way how quietly he filled his mind with really useful knowledge and pondered gravely upon men and things when the test was applied and he had a distinct duty to perform he at once excelled in the doing of it and the young colonel made a model regiment when he had to face the enemy and beat him he was equal to the exigency and as soon as he became famous it was remembered how finely he covered a horrible retreat with his weak rear guard some at the moment saw his soldierly merits or he would not have been selected to do what was urgently needed as a matter of course when the work was done he sank into the ruck of colonels but only to emerge a victorious general on the plains of india End of section one section two of wellington by george hooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter two wellesley's early indian service part one arthur wesley or wellesley as his name shall now be written for he soon followed the usage of his family in adopting that spelling arrived in india at an important moment the great administration of lord cornwallis had been followed by that of sir john shore which though useful cannot be called great and soon after the colonel landed shore with the title of lord tinmouth set sail for england there was an interval of some weeks during which period lord hobart was acting governor-general and then came richard lord mornington the brilliant scholar and tried administrator who was destined to leave a broad mark on british policy in india to extend the frontiers and augment the power of the company and stamp the name of marquis wellesley upon the pages of its astonishing history it was the union of the two brothers in council and on the field which imparted such solidity and lustre to those eventful years for although the younger was conspicuous as a man of action he was also a sagacious statesman and known to be so by the large-minded and enterprising viceroy some have thought and said that a change came over arthur wellesley in seventeen ninety seven it is not so the unity of his character is complete from the beginning to the end the faculties he possessed came with him when he was born and remained neither more nor less like the rest of us great and little he could cultivate he could not add to them and the peculiarity in his case is that he cultivated them in a manner different from that of other men lord mornington was distinguished at school and college because he stood the accepted tests arthur could not be distinguished that is recognized because he took his own way to which none of the received tests applied intrinsically as the results showed he was just as able that is he could do as much and even say as much if the substantial sense be regarded as his eloquent and polished brother arthur had acquired and assimilated the knowledge of things that would be useful to him and had trained his judgment but the things were not those which would have won him a high place in a class list and the judgment he developed was essentially practical in his voluminous writings one looks in vain for a spark of imagination yet the quality must have been in his mind for without a powerful imagination no man can be a great general in him it worked upon facts and he called it a gift of rapid and accurate calculation he had passed his life he once said to crocker in trying to see what was on the other side of a hill and a vivid as well as sober imagination is essential to the accomplishment of that feat in peace as well as in war his was not the oratorical and literary mode of demonstration and because he had not the current coin of culture he was supposed to be poor in capacity and dull in mind the mistake was natural and inevitable at the time but it is now without excuse he had and proved that he had when tried an inborn wealth of nature 
an immense stock of useful and practical knowledge and a solid judgment which no man can obtain by mere exercise of will they came out for use as soon as he got a command in ireland they were visible to his comrades in holland under the ordeal of a painful and desperate retreat and they soon became conspicuous to men on the large and hazardous field of southern india the man did not change he remained the same but he found much arduous work to be done and he did it with a vigour and thoroughness which prove how great were his capacities and how well he was prepared although his mode of preparation his mental and moral culture had not received the conventional stamp it may be said of him as much as of any man that he was self-made but it must also be added that the happy advent of his brother as the king's representative and the company's chief servant gave him the opportunity at this early period of disclosing his worth as an administrator a statesman and a soldier that was the gift of fortune the rest he supplied from his own stores the proof is to be found in his published writings it is plain from them that he went fully armed for his work that he took a large view of it and that he fell upon it with the quiet unflagging industry which marked his whole career although there are no records of his angers school days and few glimpses of his dublin life it is impossible to believe that the climate of the ganges valley gave him suddenly a great intellect a piercing insight a matured judgment and the power of steady application that he was recognized as a man of ability may be inferred from the fact that within two months of his landing he was consulted by general st ledger on a project for establishing light artillery and was nominated to command an expedition against the manila islands if his observations on the artillery question are now out of date seeing that horse artillery batteries have long been established in india they were sensible and practical when made for in seventeen ninety seven it was utterly impracticable to find horses in numbers sufficient to supply the loss and waste but his suggestion that a beginning should be made on a small scale is characteristic not less so is the request which he preferred to the government that the chief command should be given to another officer while at the same time he says in a letter to his brother that if the offer were repeated he would accept it taking the chance that the large force they intend to send the known pusillanimity of the enemy and my exertions will compensate in some degree for my want of experience steady in upholding his rights he never pushed himself forward but that did not prevent him from stating his opinions firmly on all occasions and it is easy to see now the weight which they must have carried the manila command fell to colonel wellesley but the troops did not embark until august and were recalled in september when they had got no farther than penang on the malay peninsula the expedition is however so far remarkable that it caused the thoughtful young commander to compose a series of regimental orders for on board ship which even now may be read with profit and led him to write a memorandum on pulo penang showing how thoroughly he dealt with the subject not merely or mainly in its military aspects as might have been expected but in its relation to and bearing upon commerce another paper written about the same time on bengal puts in a still stronger light the economic tendencies of the man who if he had not been a soldier would have been a financier the comments and arguments have now only a historical importance but they exhibit him as a pleader for less interference with the freedom of trade than that which subsisted and they show the far-reaching nature of his youthful speculations the personal apart from the speculative view of him is disclosed in some of his letters there is now and then a touch of sarcasm even at this early period not of the flighty but rather the grim kind thus after telling lord mornington that sir john shore had made a kind of agreement with the nabob of Oud, the colonel assumes that it will not be observed as it seems a rule of policy here he adds never to give assistance to your friend when he stands most in need of it and always to break your treaty with him at the moment when it would be most convenient to him that you should fulfil its stipulations 
a hit intended to strike both sides. He complained that the medical board had transferred the care of the sick on board ship to the surgeons, and among other things he described it as depriving him of that part of the superintendence over his corps, which was most gratifying to him, one in which he could render the greatest service to his soldiers. Another grievance was that the troops were to be placed under the command of the ship's captain, but he sent in such a spirited remonstrance that Sir John Shore at once revoked the foolish order. In writing to his brother concerning the French in India, the colonel says that as long as they have an establishment in Mauritius, Great Britain cannot call herself safe in India. They will come here, he insists, seek service in the armies of the native princes, and soon discipline their numerous armies in the new mode which they have adopted in Europe, than which nothing can be more formidable to the small body of fighting men of which the company's armies in general consist. So that, as he afterwards put it, the question was even then whether the French or we shall be masters in the Deccan. The new mode of fighting he had seen and knew its power, but it did not make him alter his own. From the same source we learn that after a year's experience he thought India a miserable country to live in, and that he had formed an opinion of the natives not at all favorable to them, and far too sweeping in its denunciations. The Hindus were bad, but the Moslems were worse, and they were all atrociously cruel. Their meekness and mildness did not exist, but they stood in awe of Europeans. As to perjury, there was more of that in Calcutta alone than in all Europe taken together. Harsh judgments, which time might or might not have modified, but bad as India was, he hoped his brother would become governor-general, a hope then about to be fulfilled, for a fortnight after expressing it, news came to hand that his wish would be gratified. It was then, as he was on the point of sailing for Penang, that he wrote, I shall be happy to be of service to you in your government, adding apparently in reply to some fraternal remark in Lord Mornington's letter, but such are the rules respecting the disposal of all patronage in the country that I can't expect to derive any advantage from it, which I should not obtain if any other person were governor-general, forgetting that no one would fail to remember that he was the governor-general's brother, an indestructible fact which helped to give his strong personal character fair play and his genius free scope. In the cold weather of 1797, he visited Lord Hobart at Madras. The coast was to him a new country, and as even then the eyes of men were turned toward Mysuru, they dreaded and seemed to dread a fresh eruption into the Carnatic. The colonel profited by the chance to make himself acquainted with the topography of the hills. There is no record of his excursions, but his military memoranda contain passages which prove that he inspected personally a considerable district on both sides of the main line of march to Bangalore. When I was in the country, he wrote, I thought that the road from Velour to Tripatore might be shortened and removed from the frontier by carrying a line through the Argarum Valley. I was informed, however, that it would want water. At that time, 1797, he went into the Barahamal, where he found that a Colonel Reed had made a fine road through this savage region by Riacata to the outlet on the Bangalore side. Political knowledge he could obtain at the desk, but topography, which ever had a special interest for him, was only to be studied in the saddle. He made the most of his holiday rambles, and indeed he always, wherever he went, almost to the end of his life, imprinted on his retentive mind the features of any tract through which he travelled. Colonel Wellesley returned to Calcutta, and in the first months of 1798 there were great changes in Fort St. George and Fort William. Lord Hobart went home and was succeeded for some months by General Harris. Sir John Shore embarked early in March, and Lord Mornington, after halting a fortnight at Madras, landed on May 17th in the capital of his realm. It was at the foot of a letter announcing the fact to Mr. Lushington, a high official at Fort St. George, that the colonel first signed as Arthur Wellesley. 
from this time he comes more directly in contact with the grave and stirring questions of policy which pressed upon the new governor-general who had to handle at once the difficult problems which had been shirked by his pacific predecessor and it was then that the coolness and judgment of the younger brother came into play the state of india was perplexed and perplexing the mahratta chiefs were the masters of hindustan except oud and the company's possessions in bengal and the great mogul existed in delhi under the shadow of their swords they were also the principal power in the deccan for the neutrality enjoined upon sir john shore had enabled them to defeat the overconfident nizam at kurdla but the weakness of this formidable confederacy was radical the leaders were engaged in perpetual strife for supremacy the other power in the deccan the power most dreaded was tipu sultan of mysore who although his wings had been clipped by lord cornwallis was yet a constant menace to the carnatic he was a neighbour he had a sea-coast and ports through which he could and did communicate with the french he had defeats to avenge he was inspired by moslem fanaticism unrestrained by the politic considerations which governed the nizam and he was a new man the second and the last as it proved of the house which his able father Hyder ali hoped to found the european adventurer who sought wealth and often found it in the native courts was also a characteristic of the hour the savoyard de boigne who was almost a genius had disciplined a body of infantry counted by tens of thousands in shinda's dominions north of the nerbuda and a scotchman had helped to cast the guns which men of several nations organized into a powerful artillery at hyderabad m raymond a frenchman had formed a corps numbering fourteen thousand and alike in hindustan and the deccan soldiers of fortune followed in the steps if none reached the eminence of duplex and bussy the mahratta power in the south stretched from the bay of bengal to the arabian sea but it was enfeebled by dissensions the two mohammedan states mysore and hyderabad were jealous of each other and though all desired to expel the intruders who came across the seas experience showed that hindu and moslem could not combine to effect the common wish in the northwest the afghan zimaun a feeble representative of the great ahmed shah who sought to rival the victor of paniput could only contrive to inspire a vague dread either in delhi or calcutta the young wellesley a cool observer rightly judged that the invader of the punjab would get no farther than lahore basing his opinion on what he called the inutility as well as the difficulties of the enterprise there is no plunder to be got now and zaman's object he thought was only to drive farther from him those worst of neighbours the sikhs the british settlements were a mere fringe on the edges of india the stronghold was bengal with its influence stretching up the ganges valley into oud on one side and central india on the other the madras possessions were a strip on the coast and bombay held little more than its island home and was a power only by dint of ships and treasure but the company a mystery inexplicable to the native indian mind had the priceless advantage of political unity to compensate for geographical separateness a unity which the firm hands of lord mornington wielded with irresistible power the people in england wished to enjoy incompatible advantages to retain their oriental dominions yet hold back from conquests it could not be done if they did not desire to advance inland and there can be no doubt that the desire was sincere the native princes passionately longed to expel the alien intruders or bring them into subjection their ability to do so was limited by the impossibility of combination among inveterate rivals yet it was always possible for two or more to form a temporary alliance which if it did not succeed in the main object caused disturbance and inflicted loss even one state as hyder and tipu had shown could imperil the existence of madras a policy of quietism therefore incurred a maximum of risk with a minimum of security and as the rule of cornwallis and shore distinctly proved 
even a policy of quietism could not be strictly observed cornwallis had to war against tippoo and shore felt bound to intervene in oud and set up sadat ali with the strong hand when lord mornington arrived in india he found that the nearest peril was still mysore he had come fresh from europe then ringing with french successes and the first intelligence which greeted him was that tippoo had just concluded an alliance with the french governor of the mauritius and that a french frigate had actually landed some scores of soldiers at mangalore followed a few weeks later by the impressive news that bonaparte at the head of a large army had invaded egypt with the professed ulterior object of attacking india by the red sea route some exercise of the imagination is required to realize the effect produced by such startling facts at a time when news travelled slowly and was magnified by distance whether bonaparte intended or not to push his enterprise if he could so far as india certain it is that he spoke of seizing egypt when he was yet in italy and that as soon as he got to paris he besought the french war office to lend him Rennell's map of hindustan lord mornington of course did not know facts which came to light when the napoleon correspondence was published it was enough for him that tippoo had sent envoys to the mauritius that he had sought and that governor malartic in a public proclamation had promised french assistance which tippoo only required to declare war against the english and purge india of these villains lord mornington therefore resolved on instant war and sent orders directing general harris acting governor of madras to collect his troops and march upon seringapatam he was too impetuous the authorities were appalled at the prospect for they had not the means of waging war and a strong argumentative letter from secretary webb backed by the dry declaration of adjutant-general close that six months would be needed for preparation effectually cooled his ardour and with pain and regret he read both and cancelled the order colonel wellesley had already given his opinion on the subject with his usual coolness he went direct to the heart of the matter admitted that the cause of war was sufficient but held that the moment was inopportune with characteristic moderation he thought it possible to save british honour without doing anything that would render war inevitable and suggested that if explanation were demanded tippoo finding that he had gained so little by the french alliance would deny the whole and be glad of an opportunity of getting out of the scrape the young statesman had too good an opinion of tippoo's common sense when he offered his pacific advice tempered by the wise remark that in the meantime we shall believe as much as we please and shall be prepared against all events although no demand for explanation was made on mysore at that stage the viceroy was resolved to strike when prepared especially as he learned at a later period from the secret committee of the court of directors that they were really alarmed by the sailing of bonaparte's expedition from toulon and the startling proceedings in the mauritius and it is an instructive fact that the ruling minds in london and calcutta though so far apart reached identical conclusions at precisely the same time the middle of june but lord mornington could not act until he had ample means and was compelled to wait six months before these could be arrayed he employed the time in renewing relations with the nizam in cleverly disbanding the french disciplined battalions at hyderabad substituting for them company sepoys and in making a subsidiary treaty with that ruler he now had an ally and he trusted with reason that the chronic quarrels between the mahrattas would keep them and their vast resources quiet so the summer months passed away and the cold season returned yet still the work of preparation was going forward colonel wellesley spent much of the summer in writing military and political memoranda for the use of his brother papers which remain to show the man as he was and how deeply he had studied the politics as well as the military topography of southern india Shinda had practically obtained control over the peshwa and the question was whether the government of india could justly attack Shinda in order to set free the nominal head of the mahratta confederacy and enable him to help us in the war with tippoo 
Wellesley took up the Act of Parliament, examined it thoroughly, and came to the conclusion that the government had no right to make war on him unless he was secretly allied with Tipu, and even then it must be clear that the alliance exists and must not be a mere surmise. And the upshot of his inquiries is just this, that even were Shinda to contemplate or begin hostilities against the rival Mahratta's chiefs, the government cannot in a new treaty with the Peshawa make an engagement to attack him. Then he adds this caustic remark, which illustrates the dry directness and rectitude of his understanding. It is true, he says, that this almost entirely annihilates the power of making treaties, but I imagine that to have been the purpose and intention of the Act of Parliament. The greatest stickler for legality could not have put the fact more forcibly, and it is all the more creditable to the young soldier, because he knew that the question then was, were we, or the French, to have the superiority in the Deccan? That question was partly answered by the decisive measures at Hyderabad, which ended in the shipment of the French officers for Europe but Tipu still remained, and the work of providing adequately against him went on apace. In August, Wellesley with the 33rd was sent from Calcutta to Madras. The transport struck on the Sagar Reef, but happily the wind was light and she suffered little damage. But she was three weeks in sailing from the mouth of the Huli to Fort St. George. Tell Blank, he wrote from shipboard, that I conceive it to be very inconsistent with the principles of the Christian religion to give people bad water, and you may say likewise that a Gentile could not have done worse than give us a bottle of good rum by way of muster or sample and fill the casks with the worst I ever saw. I have written to him a public letter on the subject, and let us hope that the dishonest purveyor suffered accordingly, though no penalties could be discovered which would make these rogues honest. From the effects of the bad water, Wellesley, and he says nearly every man, had dysentery, while fifteen soldiers, as fine men as any we had, died. But that was the crime of the storekeeper at Fort William, who to save himself trouble filled the casks from the foul stream off Calcutta. The army commissariat was always a matter on which Wellesley kept an eye. He had also to look out for himself. In September he asks his brother Henry to send him some Bengal sheep, some potatoes, some smoked humps and rounds of beef, and when it became probable that the army would take the field, he asks for a soup tureen and dishes for twelve people. I shall not want plates, knives, forks, or spoons, he says, as everybody in an Indian camp brings those articles for himself. The host finds eatables and dishes only. He is always alive to social influences, hoping that Mornington has been introduced to the ladies of Calcutta and that you give dinners frequently. Indeed, one of the striking things in his correspondence is the fraternal anxiety he shows throughout upon all objects affecting the reputation and prosperity of the Governor-General. But his vigilance was everywhere. We have seen how careful he was of the health of his men, especially those in the 33rd writing from Madras to the Adjutant General at Calcutta, with that touch of irony which sometimes gives an edge to his letters, he says, I am well acquainted with the manner in which recruits are looked after and taken care of in Fort William, and I will therefore be much obliged to you if you will take measures to send them to me as soon as possible, and warn the storekeeper not to send bad water with these recruits. A certain major had the temerity to object to his interfering with the 33rd, when not actually under his immediate command. He reproved, but gave the officer good advice, adding, Of this you may be certain, that however my attention may be engaged by other objects, whenever I find it necessary, I shall interfere in everything which concerns the 33rd. Not a safe man to contend with, especially when you are in the wrong. Upon the great question of peace or war, the younger Wellesley was persistently for peace, if it could be had, but in any case for such preparation as would enable the government to defend the Carnatic or invade Mysore. In maintaining that position he had to battle with the advisers of Lord Clive, the new governor of Madras, who was not so dull as he appeared to be, but unaccustomed to consider questions of the magnitude of those then before him. 
yet one who improved and became docile under gentle treatment. He was embarrassed also by the military board, that cursed institution, but he found General Harris intelligent, reasonable, and anxious to have Lord Clive kept in the right way. He had made friends who were to become famous, Monroe and Malcolm, for example, and he described Barry Close as the ablest officer in the company's service. With the strong help of his brother, he so far triumphed over opponents as to secure attention to the abounding wants of the army, and thus fulfilled that half of his plan which concerned what we should now call mobilization. By slow degrees, hard work, and careful management, a respectable force was collected between midsummer and Christmas. But he could not avert war. Lord Mornington intended to negotiate with Tipu in due time. I am very anxious, wrote Wellesley to his brother on September 19th, to hear of the conclusion of your negotiations with the Peshawa and the Nizam, that you may make your proposition, whatever it may be, to Tipu as soon as possible, and that he may see that you are not bent on annihilating him. And he counted on the display of strength in the Carnatic to render the Mysorean eager for a fair settlement. As late as October 21st, he thought war should be avoided if possible, though he was, of course, ready to make it short and sharp if no other issue could be attained. That is why he urged on the local authorities, but it was a wearisome task and made him write on the 24th, I am heartily sick of the business and wish I was anywhere else. So discouraging is the combat with stupidity. Nevertheless, he worked on pushing forward the battering train to Velour, collecting draft cattle, and intent as ever upon supplies. He prevailed on Lord Clive to appoint a commissary of stores, and hoped he would appoint a commissary of grain and provisions. Matters will then be brought into some shape, he writes to Henry Wellesley at the end of October, and we shall know what we are about, instead of trusting to the vague calculations of a parcel of blockheads who know nothing and have no data. Always the spirit of the man of business is to be found in the general who is great, when not on the battlefield, as well as when fired by visible strife, and that spirit animated the young soldier just as much when his military life began as when he was at the height of his career. The same indications are seen in the youthful Bonaparte. The sans culotte of the South, we find him writing in November 1793, should have no other thought than that of purging the republic of tyrants. Then follows the thoroughly practical conclusion. In order to achieve so essential an end promptly, citizens, you must procure horses for the park of artillery which is besieging Toulon. So, without any high-flown declarations, Wellesley labored hard to collect his draft bullocks, fill the provision and munition depots, and provide well-supplied bazaars. Early in November, Lord Mornington decided to act in a way which would bring matters to a crisis. He addressed a letter to the Sultan of Mysore, friendly in its tone and substance, but taking note in a firmly polite way of the discrepancy between Tipu's professions of amity and his negotiations with the French. The Governor-General was able to say that the Peshawa and the Nizam concurred with him, for Hyderabad had become an ally and Pune had been neutralized, and that he proposed to send Major Doveden, who was well known to you, who would explain the sole means which the government and its allies thought would remove distrust and suspicion and establish peace on a durable foundation. This step only produced from Tipu a reply saying that the French, full of vice and deceit, the enemies of mankind, had put about reports to ruffle the minds of both governments and glossing over the Mauritius incident. He was surprised that any allusion to war should be addressed to such a peaceful man as himself. He was, he said, resident at home, at times taking the air, and at others amusing myself with hunting at a spot which is used as a pleasure ground. He was content to rest on the observance of treaties, and thought, though he did not say, that Major Doveton need not trouble himself to visit Siringipatam. The answer was thus an evasion on the main point, an instinct with deceit all over. But it proved the accuracy of Arthur Wellesley's estimate that at this stage Tipu's grand object would be to gain time till he could see what was going on in Egypt and Europe, 
though it did not confirm the earlier conjecture that he would seize the opportunity of getting out of a scrape. Practically, the question of war or peace was then decided, and strong as the case against the Mysorean looks now, it must have appeared ten times stronger to the men who were living in the heated atmosphere of ninety-eight, and who were at hand grips with a host of enemies. Wellesley's great aim now was to bring his brother to Fort St. George, he had felt the full force of dull inertia, and he wanted the steam power of a resolute governor-general to drive the public machinery. Lord Mornington did not long delay, but before he arrived at Fort St. George, a duel had been fought, the result of which placed Arthur in command of the troops collected about Arney. His senior, Colonel Ashton, had been mortally wounded in a duel which was no fault of his, and the duties he perforce relinquished Colonel Wellesley was directed to perform. He was now in his place, directing with all his might the final preparations for his first Indian campaign. His life in the camps on the Palar was far more active and anxious than that he had led in Fort St. George. An army, said Frederick the Great, goes upon its belly, and Wellesley's first care was for his bazaars, on which the comfort of the troops depended, for his grain supply, of which there was none, and his draft cattle, without which the army could not move. It was no easy task, but he accomplished it by dint of strict regulations and personal supervision. He had to contend with dishonest and incapable agents, European as well as Asiatic, with the caprice of the brinjaris, or native grain merchants, and he managed them by humouring their fancies, with the slowness of the Madras officials and the general slackness and bad methods all around. There was a different rate of exchange in the several camps, and a government rate which agreed with none, so he suspended the latter. We are sadly off for money, he wrote to Henry Wellesley. Between ourselves, the paymaster general has too many mercantile concerns. On another occasion he found that the superintendent of bazaars had the contract for the sale of Arak and his remonstrance on the impropriety had an instant effect. He asked for help when he took command, having started at an hour's notice without a servant, and the Madras people sent him two companies' officers, neither of whom understood a syllable of the language, and one so stupid that I can make no use of him, and the other such a rascal that half of my occupation consists in watching him, lest under the authority of my name he should play tricks in the country." In addition to his labours in providing the troops with provisions, transport, and equipment, he attended assiduously to their discipline and training, so that when General Harris arrived in the camp on January 29th, 1799, to take command, he found a fine, well-organised, and effective division. It so happened that it became a question whether or not Lord Mornington should join the army in the field. His brother was aghast at the notion, as he saw that it would deprive the general of the command. All I can say upon the subject is, was his frank comment, that if I were in General Harris's situation, and you joined the army, I should quit it. Lord Mornington cordially agreed, remarking that he had only raised the question because certain persons made such a clamour. We may guess at the amount of friction even he had to endure from his statement that only with the utmost difficulty could he restrain the council from interfering with the commander-in-chief, but that he had now plainly declared war against every attempt of the kind. In that wholesome mood the colonel sought to keep him steadfast by saying that it was impossible to make the general too respectable or hold him too high. Perhaps there was some exaggeration, but it was of the right kind, springing from a zeal for thoroughness which is absolutely essential to efficiency in military affairs. Resolved to do everything in his power to ensure the grand object, he borrowed money and sold his own horses to aid in promptly moving troops, and he paid into the public chest monies which previously other officers had always taken to themselves. So the ponderous machine was prepared despite the incapacity the want of decision and of attention to essentials so painfully visible to the active young man of business, and in a short time it started forward by the hill roads that led to the capital of Mysoru. Down to the last moment, Colonel Wellesley, seeing how short was the available time, feared that the enterprise would not be finished in less than two campaigns. 
audacious and resolute he was not sanguine even in youth the signal having been given the army moved slowly into and through the hill country on its westerly course the nizam's contingent six thousand foot under colonel roberts and captain malcolm and ten thousand horse which says wellesley they call twenty five thousand under mir alum having descended toward the coast joined the main body the hyderabad troops were then reinforced by the thirty third regiment and the whole placed under wellesley's command the direction of the march was upon bangalore through the baramahal a parcel of rugged hill territory obtained from tipu by cornwallis simultaneously a force from bombay under general stuart six thousand strong landed at kananor ascended the gauts and took post near sedasir a summit whence the tableland of mysoru lying sheer below was clearly visible almost as far as siringapatam harris crossed the frontier on march fifth and stuart attained his airy on the second thus placing himself within reach of tipu if tipu chose to attack he did choose for while the immense columns of the main army were struggling through the valleys in order to gain the plateau and before they could extricate themselves from the jungle paths tipu resolved to strike his weaker bombay antagonist on march fifth when general harris was barely over the frontier stuart from his watch-tower saw a huge camp arise below and a green standard floating above a great pavilion the next day before stuart could concentrate his little band or even reinforce the advance post at sedasir tipu was on him with a tiger spring three native sepoy battalions were suddenly assailed in front and rear by the hostile troops which had stealthily crept up through the jungles and general hartley on the alert at break of day had only just time to warn stuart of the peril the troops were surprised yet those three battalions commanded by colonel montresor so stoutly fought tipu for more than four hours that the general had time to bring up the seventy seventh and part of the seventy fifth foot and these after half an hour's fight prevailed and swept away the enemy's column which had assailed the rear of montresor's sturdy band still it was a near thing for the sepoys were exhausted by fatigue and their supply of ammunition was nearly at an end tipu retreated to his camp and in a few days disappeared but stuart also thought it prudent to withdraw at once to sidapur where he still covered the magazines at Kurg. had tipu brought up his whole army instead of a part he might have driven stuart down the gout might but probably would not considering the stoutness of the bombay sepoys and the tougher materials furnished by two english regiments End of section two. Section three of Wellington by George Hooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two. Wellesley's early Indian service. Part two. It was not until three weeks later that the Mysorean encountered his other and more redoubtable foe. His army was weaker by several hundreds and discouraged by defeat but he was in his own country had a fine body of horsemen and still preserved a central position between the column from bombay on the west and the host pressing on from the eastward his opportunities had he known how to use them were considerable for general harris had to move through a country of rock jungle and forest and guard a convoy which covered a vast area the army wellesley's force being on the left marched in two columns enclosing the huge mass of guns animals and carts there were a battering train of fifty pieces a moving arsenal another fifty cannon and altogether above a hundred thousand bullocks besides all these writes the colonel the number of elephants camels bullocks carts coolies and plunderers belonging to individuals in the army particularly in that of the nizam was beyond calculation yet at least double the number in the employment of the public in short when on the march there was a multitude in motion which covered about eighteen square miles the consequence was that when they entered the mysoru country the draught cattle began to die for want of food 
however on inquiry says colonel wellesley it was found that the root of the evil lay in a parcel of absurd impracticable shop-keeping regulations which had been made for the bullock department under which no great undertaking could prosper and the first step when the army got near bangalore was to abolish them all then the useless lumber which wellesley had pressed the general to leave at valor was destroyed and nothing survived but the useful equipment he was however of opinion that if tippoo had had sense and spirit sufficient to use his cavalry and infantry as he might have done the army would have been kept much longer in the jungles of bangalore as it was his light horse the best of their kind in the world kept the enemy in sight and even destroyed as much forage as they could nevertheless the army covered ten or twelve miles a day and sometimes more and suffered no loss of importance during the whole march the frontier places mostly fortified hills which rose in isolated blocks sheer from the plain were easily captured or surrendered and the army bending westward made for the quarter where tippoo gathered up his flustered troops they were found near malavelli on the right bank of the madur an affluent of the coveti general harris did not intend to attack when he came in sight of the enemy on march twenty seventh he was about to encamp for the day but as the advance guard and even the lines selected were under fire and as the maizoru cavalry showed a disposition to charge the general supported his front and an impromptu combat ensued wellesley the thirty-third leading moved in echelon against the right flank of tippoo's array and as the operation seemed to open a gap in the centre tippoo tried to break through but in the rear stood three regiments of horsemen under general floyd who dashed at once into the offensive column routing and driving it from the field wellesley's vigorous onset combined with floyd's charge really decided the action on the other flank a small body of the enemy's horse rode at the european brigade some of them piercing the line but most of them falling before it the combat was over in a couple of hours neither tippoo's infantry nor cavalry being able to stand for a longer period itself a sufficient testimony to the unhesitating dash of the british brigades in fact malavelli gave them the moral ascendancy which they steadily maintained they lost a few score in killed and wounded the mysoreans perhaps two thousand it was wellesley's first indian battle want of water compelled general harris to fall back on malavelli where there were tanks and here he halted for a day tippoo hovering in the vicinity expected that his opponent would move straight on the capital by the left bank of the coveti he was soon disappointed for rightly judging that tippoo was unprepared on the other bank general harris on the twenty ninth deftly and secretly marched upon Sosili, where the next day the whole army crossed the river by an easy ford he thus put the river between him and tippoo approached general stuart and the small columns operating on his own left gained access to a country not yet ravaged and was able to march upon the least defensible side of seringa patam the point where he was not expected five short marches brought him unopposed to the southern side of the fortress into which tippoo had retired after his defeat on april sixth general floyd was sent with a strong detachment of all arms to meet general stuart but before he started the siege operations began Siringa Patam stands or stood on an island formed by the Coveti and filled up the westerly end with fortified forts on both branches along the river banks and of course on those facing south and east. The palace and mosque towered above the walls and pleasure grounds, interspersed with ruined buildings and cut off by a line of entrenchments, occupied the larger half of the island coming up from the southward general harris pitched his camp facing east behind an aqueduct which was carried in a southerly direction his rear protected by rough ground and his left resting on the coveri above the town 
the space between the aqueduct and the fortress was occupied by the enemy whose rockets annoyed the camp and on the day of his arrival he determined to dislodge them by a night attack here we come upon what has been made so much of as colonel wellesley's repulse two columns were sent against the line of tipu's four posts the left under colonel shaw succeeded the right under wellesley failed the aqueduct meandered in the form of the letter s in the upper limb was a tope or grove in the lower the village of sultan Peta. the thirty-third got into confusion in the gloom and wellesley's attack was frustrated his explanation is that the night was dark that the enemy was strongly posted and that he could not find out the post which he was to occupy but he attacked it at daylight on the sixth he writes and carried it with ease and little loss he resolved thenceforth and his reason explains the failure that of his own will he would never suffer an attack to be made by night upon an enemy who is prepared and strongly posted and whose posts have not been reconnoitred by daylight evidently that had not been done and the hurried enterprise was an exemplification of more haste less speed general harris visited the spot two days afterwards found it not so favourable for keeping hold of as colonel shaw's position higher up he also states that on the fourth general baird having gone out by night against the enemy's horse and cut them up missed his road coming back although one would have thought it impossible for it was starlight no wonder night attacks so often fail in the abortive skirmish wellesley was hit in the knee a slight touch from which i have felt no inconvenience and according to general harris he was in a good deal of agitation when he reported his ill success at midnight plainly he was much vexed but the story put about years afterwards that general baird's friendly intervention alone gave him an opportunity of retrieving his failure is not credible in fact the reflection of general harris on the night attacks altogether circumstances considered we got off very well is not the language of an angry commander-in-chief when the bombay army entered the camp on april fourteenth the besiegers were solidly established on a strong line stretching from the bank of the coveti below to the bank above the town and as it had been determined to attack the northwestern angle because it could be battered by converging lines stuart's troops were sent over the river this served the double purpose of taking ground beyond the coveti whence a flank fire from the north could be brought to bear on the weak angle of the fortress and of misleading tipu he had not like his father a soldier's eye nor like his father that steadfast courage which glows more brightly as perils increase his resolve to fight was unshaken but he fought in the spirit of a doomed man yet without displaying any of that bright invention which is sometimes the fruit of despair he seems to have known instinctively that his annihilation as a sovereign had been decreed as it had and to have run halfway to meet his fate he had made up his mind to die fighting but while sultan he would also gratify his vengeance he had some european prisoners of war and he murdered them by torture hammering nails into their skulls he had nothing left but his gloomy valour and his cruelty the besiegers worked steadily on advancing their posts building their batteries and pounding the protruding angle from both sides the mysoreans dashing out upon the bombay troops who seemed the best mark were firmly met and retired with a loss of many hundred men no other sortie was attempted and on may second two heavy batteries opening at short range on the curtain south of the bastion at the angle made a practicable breach in a couple of days enterprising officers explored the river-bed and some crept up to the foot of the defences they found the water in the hard bed of the river not much more than a foot deep and the obstacles on the inner side easily surmountable therefore it was resolved to storm the place a little afternoon on the fifth when the native who is alert at night and dawn is apt to seek repose but lest his suspicions should be aroused by any obvious movement four thousand three hundred troops more than one-half europeans 
were packed into the trenches early in the morning. General Baird, who had been a prisoner in Seringapatam when Haider ruled there, commanded the whole. He gave one column to Colonel Sherbrooke, another to Colonel Dunlop, and put the reserve under Colonel Wellesley. When the hour arrived for the onset, Baird, giving the signal, led the stormers out of the trenches. In ten minutes the fierce columns, though struck by a sharp fire, had forded the river, ascended the breach, and planted the British flag on the ruins. Then Sherbrooke cleared the walls to the south, and Dunlop's troops, for Dunlop fell in the trench, swept the northern side, and in two hours the place was won. Not without encountering the grim resistance of fanaticism and despair, for Tipu, surprised by the sudden onset and uproar, mounted his horse and flung himself in the path of Dunlop's column, heading his host with commanding bravery and dying in the midst of five hundred men whose bodies were piled up above and around his corpse. Wellesley entered the fortress immediately after the assault, says Colonel Gerwood, and was one of the few present when Tipu Sultan's body, which was still warm, was discovered in the Sally Port Gateway on the northern front of the works. The sons of Tipu surrendered to General Baird, who the next morning was succeeded in the command of Seringapatam by Colonel Wellesley. No reason for the change has been given. Major General Baird, having desired to be relieved, Colonel Wellesley, being next on the roster, was ordered on the same night, the 4th, to command within the fort. Such is Gerwood's brief but explicit statement. On the other hand, Baird simply says in his official report that he was relieved by Colonel Wellesley, and he certainly remonstrated in terms so intemperate that he requested and obtained permission to withdraw them. Whatever the reason, it cannot in the least affect the character of Wellesley, who as usual obeyed orders. General Harris did not consult Lord Mornington, but he divined his wishes and learned two months afterwards that had he not appointed the colonel to the post, the governor-general would have done so, because the knowledge and experience which he had of his character showed that his brother possessed the necessary qualifications for such employment. Nor was this step taken too soon. That the troops should plunder was inevitable. They had come to push of bayonet with Tipu's people, and had stormed his capital. But the disorder had to be stopped for the sake of the army as well as the place. Nothing, wrote Wellesley, can have exceeded what was done on the night of the 4th. Scarcely a house was left unplundered. He called at once for fresh troops. He asked for a provost marshal, saying that until a few were hanged, the marauding would not cease. Some were hanged, and some, of course, flogged, and by dint of just action he was able to report two days later that the plunder was stopped, the fires extinguished, and that the inhabitants who had fled were returning. In short, by vigor and justice he restored confidence among a people who were quick to recognize the strong just man whom they can respect as well as fear. During the next three months the governor of Seringapatam was engaged in the numberless occupations which beset a man of business. He was obliged to be a soldier, engineer, statesman, traffic manager, and even sanitary authority. It was his duty to restore discipline, shaken a little not only by the plunder of the town, but by the enormous amount of the prize money, over a million sterling, which for a moment it was feared would not be distributed according to the general's promise. Then he had to bury Tipu, which was done with due pomp and circumstance, and to see that proper respect was shown to his family. But the government had determined to restore the old Hindu dynasty, dispossessed by Haider, the representative of which was at that time following the trade of a potter. The sons and wives of Tipu duly pensioned were sent to Valor. The Hindu gentleman, to his delight and astonishment, was placed on the Musnud, and Mysoru town was fixed on as his seat of government. Wellesley's strong opinions on the question of prize were creditable to his sense of decency as well as equity. He was disgusted with an order to search the Zenana for treasure, and only obeyed when he could not avert that grasping action, taking every precaution to render the search as decent and as little injurious to the feelings of the ladies as possible. 
the prize agents proposed to sell the clothes of Tipu by public auction, which would not only be disgraceful, but might be unpleasant. He stopped them, and recommended that the raiment should be bought by the government or given to the princes. You may conceive, he writes to his brother, what sharks they are. This day, August 19th, I have been obliged to send an order to prevent them from selling the doors in the palace. Indeed, he had no little difficulty in keeping private property out of their maws. He took his own share, which was his due, but Lord Mornington refused to accept the hundred thousand pounds derived from the sale of ordnance and stores, which Mr. Pitt and the company offered to him. Here it may be noted that Wellesley's first thought was to repay, out of his prize money, the sum advanced by his brother to purchase his rank of lieutenant-colonel. The answer was, no consideration can induce me to accept payment of the sums which I have formerly advanced for you. So strong and genuine was the friendship of these great men. At the same time, the colonel was serving the public at a loss. His allowances did not cover the expenses entailed by his situation. I was sent here, he writes, with a garrison consisting of about half the army and a large staff, and I have not received one shilling more than I did at Fort St. George. The consequence is that I am ruined. Yet he did his daily tale of duty just as thoroughly as if the general had taken the trouble to remove the scandal. He says that since the preceding December he had in some months spent five times, in others four times more than he received, and that he signed papers authorizing officers under his command and living upon him, by the custom of the service, to obtain nearly half as much more than was by regulation due to him. No wonder he wrote to his brother, saying that he would not have referred to the subject had there been any probability that General Harris would represent his case before the Governor-General left Madras. The reason of his suffering was not only that he had been neglected by the General, but that he would not do the dirty things done elsewhere, that is, pocket what did not rightly belong to him. As early as May 8th, he put his sentiments on the company's administration in plain terms. I intend to ask to be brought away with the army, if any civil servant of the company is to be here with civil authority, who is not under my orders. For I know that the whole is a system of job and corruption, from beginning to end, of which I and my troops would be made the instruments. Never could he bear with meanness, corruption, or disorder. All kinds of work came before him and tested his administrative capacity. He shirked none and was equal to all, from the drawing up of a regulation for the administration of justice within his domain to the duties of a commissariat clerk, which he performed for a month, none having been sent him. In settling the future of the conquered province and its division among the victors, his opinion, of course, was sought. But what it is most interesting to note is that the system he favored was based on an estimate of what would be safe, creditable, and not likely to lead us into new wars. So that from the outset, the great captain who said that nothing was more horrible than a victory except a defeat had no love for war. He accepted it as a duty and a necessity, he waged it with all the vigor and skill he could command, but he would always have avoided war if avoidance would be compatible with imperial safety and imperial honor. By the middle of August, General Harris, who had been employed in reducing hill forts, delivered Tipu's country from marauding bands, and restoring tranquility so far as that could be done, retired to Madras, and the post he quitted fell to Colonel Wellesley, whose appointment to the command of the troops in Mysore is dated August 24, 1799. His new field of action was extensive and his duties onerous. The half-robber chiefs in the western hills were and long remained unsubdued. The Marathas on the north could not give up their love of a foray. The former troopers of Tipu, who had taken to the jungle, disturbed the country. There were large tracts, like Wayanad, to reduce and vassal rulers to protect. The normal state of the districts between Mysoro and the sea was one of war, and it was the business as well as the duty of the company to repress violence and establish tranquillity. 
Wellesley did all he could to overcome the disturbers. He kept a sharp eye on all their doings, he stimulated the energy of his subordinates, enjoined severe but just measures, seeing clearly that men who relied on, believed in, and lived by force would yield to no other remedy, and he visited nearly the whole of the area under his control. So far as the settlement of the country was concerned, he favoured the dismantling of the rock fortresses and the making of roads, so that the cultivators might be freed from the marauders and the traders protected from highwaymen. His great capacity for work enabled him to perform his varied public duties thoroughly and yet omit none of the social and humanising kind. It is pleasant to find him on his return from the camp to Seringapatam sending a proper assortment of garden seeds to a lady and looking after the building of an abode for Colonel Close. As the boundary walls are not handsome, he writes, I will cover those which must be near your house with a creeper. I have sent you some plantain trees and shall have others for you when the season for cutting arrives. When Lady Clive proposed to visit Mysuru, he suggested that she should not come before June, as April and May are very hot here, and he hoped she would stay at his quarters, the Daulet Bang, the Zanana of which, when a little improved, will accommodate her and her family admirably. Neither of the palaces, he adds, would answer for a woman at all, as they are so much exposed. These examples of thoughtfulness, and there are many, show the man as he was, and he looked after the interests and comforts of the poor and weak quite as carefully as those of the rich and strong, being a stern hard man to evil doers, yet always merciful, charitable, and kind. Other and more stirring employment lay before him. Throughout the autumn of 1799 and the following spring, we hear repeatedly of a certain Dondi Awag who had taken to the road. He was a Maratha who began life in Hyder's cavalry, grew wearied of service under Tipu, and began business on his own account, perhaps inspired by the success of the former. The tiger managed to have him captured and kept him in jail, made him a Moslem against his will, and gave him a new name. After the storming of Seringapatam, let loose from prison by the victors, he became at once a freebooter and easily found followers. His first essays were sharply repressed by the British and the border Marathas, but being alert and deft as well as valiant, he vanished in the jungles. He reappeared shortly afterwards in the service of the Raja of Kolapur, himself a plunderer of the first order, and fighting for the Kolapur men he killed Purishram Bao, a famous Maratha of those days. Then he returned to the wild country about Savanor and Wellesley at Seringapatam, heard of a plot devised by Dandia to carry off the young princes who were here at the time when they should be hunting with me. The colonel, who put no trust in the report, duly looked into it, but he did not stop his hunting, though he kept the princes at home. In the spring he journeyed to the coast of Malabar and was haunted all the way by reports of Dandia, upon whom he kept an eye, while studying the Nairs and Moplas and encouraging the Raja of Kurg whom he judged to be more sincere than any native he had yet seen. Soon he heard that the free lands had gained ground in the Savanor country, and when the colonel reached Seringapatam in the middle of April, the disturber had become a serious personage. The aspect of affairs in May was not bright. I think that upon the whole, he says to Monroe, we are not in the most thriving condition in this country. Polygars, Nairs, and Moplas in arms on all sides of us, an army, Dandias, full of disaffection and discontent, amounting to Lord knows what, on the northern frontier, which increases as it advances like a snowball in snow. By this time the adventurer had taken Dummel, a fort in the jungle country beyond the Wirda, and had actually defeated a body of Marathas headed by Appa Saheb, who hoped to avenge the death of his father, Purish Rambau. His army, recruited from many places, was numbered by thousands, and he was meddling in Malabar. The spectral, shadowy, flitting figure had become substantial, a despicable enemy in the colonel's eyes, yet one so full of danger that he had to be destroyed. 
out of Dundeas in India came the founders of states. In any case, while he was afoot, there could be no peace. The government of Madras were aroused at the end of May, and Mr. Secretary Webb wrote to Wellesley, You are to pursue Dundee Awag, wherever you may find him, and to hang him on the first tree. For this purpose you will receive immediate authority to enter the Mahratta frontier. That brought on the campaign which occupied all the hot weather. Wellesley was promptly in the field, joining his army at Hurihur on the Tumbudra about June 15th. He was none too soon, for the southwest monsoon had broken, pouring its mighty rains upon the western goats, hence from the hills beyond Puna to the forests of Kanara rolled the floods which filled all the great affluence of the Kisna. Over this immense tract they ran from the westward easterly, and thus crossed Wellesley's intended line of march. For Dandia had set up his tents in the jungles at the confluence of the Tumbudra with the Kistna, and especially between the Werda and the Malpurba, where at Dummel and Savanor he fronted the coming host. He was aided by the Polygars, or independent chiefs, and partially vexed by the Marathas, notably Dundo Punt Gokla. Practically he had carved his dominions out of Maratha territory, but he had the audacity to demand villages and lands from the Nizam and Mizoru, offering in exchange the services of 25,000 horsemen. Before Wellesley, hindered by the waters, could cross them, Dondia had swept down upon and killed Gokla in action, the second Maratha chief who fell under his sword. But as soon as the army were over first the Tumbudra and next the Werda, the freebooter was compelled to rely more on his shiftiness and less on his valour. So great were the obstacles that Savanor was not occupied until July 12th, by which time, however, Wellesley had cleared away everything hostile upon his flanks and rear. The enemy moved up as if intending to fight, but fled northward rapidly when he found his foes were coming at him, leaving his fort at Dummel to be taken by storm on the 26th, and all the posts and villages near captured. Gokla's Marathas under his son now joined the colonel, eager to be avenged upon, but still greatly afraid of Dondia. Wellesley, marching toward Manalo on the Malpurba, surprised the enemy's camp, charging into it with his cavalry, all the troops he had with him, and routing the defenders. All the baggage, two elephants, many camels, horses, and bullocks were captured. Dundee's six cannon had been passed over the river, but two officers and some men, seeing a boat under the fort on the other side, swam over, seized, and brought away the guns. The stroke should have been fatal, but a dexterous Maratha adventurer is not easily caught. For more than a month he led the English a weary chase through dense jungles and over swollen streams, nor was it till September 10th that Wellesley was able to try conclusions with him again. On the previous evening, being then at Yelpu Purvi, with four regiments of cavalry, his infantry, being a march behind, he learned that the Maratha was in camp about nine miles distant. The night was so bad and the horses and men so wearied with the day's march that he halted until dawn. After an anxious night he moved out in the morning. Dundia had also started and, to his amazement, saw his dreaded adversary athwart his path. Some five thousand strong, his forces took up a strong position resting on the rock and village of Cunigal, where they stood with apparent firmness. Then Wellesley, forming his four regiments into one line and leading the way, dashed into the enemy's ranks. The action was brief, for the headlong charge of men, angered by so much marching, could not be withstood. Dundee was killed, and his death ended the warfare he had called down upon himself. In his camp his little son was found and rescued by the colonel, who took him in his charge and when he quitted India, left some hundreds of pounds to be expended on the boy, of whom he was often mindful in after years. He lived until 1822, when he died of cholera. Dandia's career was short, but it was typical. Had he not been resolutely tackled, he might have founded a robber state and imitated his exemplars, the sultans of Mysoru. 
the campaign against the Mahratta trooper, none the less because the enemy was despicable, revealed the qualities possessed by the young commander, decision and boldness tempered by prudence. It also brought out afresh those aptitudes for administration which make so faint a show on the pages of history, because the details are dull, yet constitute a large as well as an essential element in success, and even mitigate the effects of failure and while intent on catching and crushing dandia the colonel did not fail to keep an eye upon the whole of his command or neglect to watch closely the politics of the deccan when the little war was over he still remained a few months in the field attending to business of all kinds growing out of the settlement of the extensive tracts which it was necessary to rescue from plundering chieftains and to render familiar with the advantages of tranquillity he did not return to Seringapatam until the end of November, and on December 2nd he was ordered by the Governor-General, now Marquis Wellesley, to assume the command of certain forces about to be assembled at Trincomalee in Ceylon, and he at once started for that port, leaving Colonel Stevenson with admirable instructions to direct operations in Wayanad and against the Polygars in the recently acquired territories the government were moved to this step by the successes of the french in europe and egypt and they designed to attack the mauritius or send an expedition to the red sea colonel wellesley laboured with his wonted ardour to prepare the troops and judging that bombay would be the best base he on his own responsibility transferred the small army to that harbour it was a bold step but it saved the expedition from failure the colonel had not sought and did not like a position which took him from Mysore, but he liked still less to be deposed and placed under the orders of General Baird, who was suddenly appointed to command, and he was hurt by the public announcement, as he put it, that he was considered competent to prepare but not to lead the troops. The truth is that the governor-general, not without a little external pressure, found that he was obliged by the rules of the service to employ a major-general and consequently that he must disappoint arthur who however felt aggrieved because he thought that something like a slur was put on him his brother wished him to act as second in command a post most distasteful to him when baird was chief but he would have submitted and had made up his mind to the sacrifice of inclination to duty when fortunately the malaria from the Bombay swamps gave him a serious fever. He therefore remained behind, and permission to resume his post in Mysore soon came. It is proper to state that the colonel cherished no rancor against Baird, whose kind, candid, and handsome manner to him he went out of his way to acknowledge. But he seems to have dreaded needlessly that the supersession would be interpreted as evidence of incapacity, he was also much distressed on account of the officers who had quitted Mysore to serve on his staff, and who were naturally anxious about their future when transferred to other duties. He himself lost nothing, for though the expedition made an interesting march from Kosir to the Nile, it was too late for active operations, as Menu in Cairo had surrendered to Hutchinson. Yet the report that an Indian column was approaching from the Red Sea had some influence on the French commander. Colonel Wellesley, still suffering a little from the fever, travelled by way of Cananor and the Western Goats to Seringapatam, which place he entered on May 7th. Writing to his brother Henry, he laughingly says, I found your friend Mrs. Stevenson, who had been with difficulty restrained from turning the house out of doors and windows during the time I was absent but that, of course, did not prevent him, in true Anglo-Indian fashion, from expressing a polite hope that she and the colonel would make use of his house, so long as they might find it convenient. The government of Madras was glad to have him back, and seconded his efforts to render the city less unhealthy, his measures for the welfare of the troops, and the judicial steps he was obliged to take at Seringapatam for the purpose of hunting out and punishing corruption and malversation which would disgrace the nougat calendar. But the condition of Mysore was gratifying. The Raja's government, he wrote, is in the most prosperous state, the country has become a garden where it is inhabited, and the inhabitants are returning fast to those parts which the last savage, in a reverent allusion to Tipu, 
had forced them to quit. He still harped, however, on the old string, supersession, which he had done nothing to deserve, and had some thoughts of going home should he see no prospect of active service. Against this Henry Wellesley pleaded strongly, pointing out that as a general peace was evidently near at hand, India was the only place in which he was likely to be employed. Although you care less about money than any man I ever yet met with, a remark worth remembering, still even in respect of cash, India, this hateful country, was better than anywhere else. So of course he stayed, perhaps never had more than a passing wish for home, and thus remained to do more solid work and gather more laurels. For nearly two years he was stationary at Seringapatam, actively engaged in various tasks, ruling with diligence, protecting the natives, assiduous in his care for sanitation, bringing the troops up to a high state of discipline, watching intently the movements in native politics, and always eager for intelligence from Europe, where the greater world drama was performed. He became a major general in April 1802, but the official announcement of that event did not reach him until the autumn. His brother, the governor-general, ran imminent risk of recall, yet finally held his post. The Peace of Amiens quieted down for the time the turbulency of European politics, and the report of its conclusion roused no enthusiasm in India. I agree with you entirely about the peace, he wrote to Mr. Webb. It establishes the French power over Europe, and when we shall have disarmed, we shall have no security except in our own abjectness. A strong expression, which events did not justify, yet not unnatural to a soldier looking upon affairs from a point so far removed from the centre of politics. The peace was a truce, but the security was in the sturdy spirit, and not in the abjectness of our heroic and tenacious forefathers. India, however, was strictly under its own necessities, and almost independent of the peace. Nevertheless, closely gauging the pressure of English opinion upon the Eastern politics, Colonel Wellesley thought there would be an outcry for the reduction of Indian armaments, perhaps to the prejudice of Indian interests, which really stood apart from those of the Western world far more in 1803 than they do now. But events occurred in the Mahratta Empire which set aside all idea of reduction, and indeed brought armies alike in the Deccan and Hindustan once more into the field. To render the new campaign and the conduct of its leaders intelligible, a brief political sketch is necessary. End of section three.